roll. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us again for uh, the, the, the the March episode of Learn with Google. And um, this this month, we're going to be talking about setting up your digital classroom and a whole bunch of other cool stuff as well. Uh, today, I am joined by my colleague Steve Smith over in Auckland. Hi, Steve. Good up. How you doing? Uh, thank you for joining. And Kimberly is floating around too somewhere, but she might be back momentarily. Um, just acknowledge the traditional owners of the cultures of the lands upon which we, we are meeting today um, and those people whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land that we live in. And we honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. Uh, that is uh, for Australian audiences. And I'll flip over to the other side of the ditch. Oh, to a brand new slide, Steve. Yeah, look at that. I've, I've updated it. So um, for those of you that come here often, you'll notice this is a different slide. So um, so to hear Mori ora, uh, in the Maunga Whakahi, in the Wai Tukukiri, ki te tūpuna tēnākwe, tēnā koutou katoa. So this one basically says, um, I pay respects to your mountains. There are many waters that join us. Uh, pay respects to your ancestors and welcome in everyone. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's kick it off. Just uh, by way of introduction, there is our team. Uh, today you've got uh, myself and Steve and Kimberly, but there are other members of the Google for Education team and you can see them there. We all do different things and together we hopefully make things happen. Um, I am going to just give you today's agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about setting up your digital classroom. Um, I know we, we spoke a bit about last, last month, we talked a little bit about lesson design and how you design for a digital world. Uh, and Chris Hart came and joined us for that. Um, I've got a lot of great feedback on that. Um, but today, let's get into some of the nitty gritty stuff, um, particularly about how you set up that digital classroom. Um, we'll talk about, I've got a guest speaker coming in today. I've got uh, Luke Starzak coming in to give you a little insight into some really cool stuff he's doing with his calendar in terms of appointment schedules. Um, and uh, it's, it's around about that time of year at the moment where we're thinking about parent teacher nights and things like that. So um, it'd be cool to see how Luke is using his calendar for that. Steve, we're going to have a little chat about AI in Google Workspace. Big announcement from Google this week about some AI stuff that's coming. And um, AI is certainly a, a pretty topical, topical topic, topical. <laughs> a popular topic. Um, topical. So we'll be talking about that. And then, of course, we'll do the usual what's new with Google for Education. There's a couple of new things to talk about as well. So we'll get stuck into that. Um, all right. Um, I, th th there are a bunch of things here, and they jump in anytime you like. Don't, don't let me do all the talking. But um, I, when when we, as you're going to school, yeah, you know, here's one of the interesting things about Google Classroom that I, I never really thought about. Google Classroom is about seven years old now, seven or eight years old, and which means it predates the pandemic, which is wow. interesting because I think a lot of teachers discovered Google Classroom when they had to go into uh, remote learning, and yet. Google Classroom was not designed specifically for remote learning. It was actually designed for in-classroom use. So it's interesting. I talk to teachers who go, oh, yeah, when, when the pandemic came along, we started using Google Classroom. It was great. Uh, and now the pandemic is sort of kind of over. You know, we, we, you know do we need to keep using it? Uh, and, and my thought would be, yeah, that's what it was designed for. It was designed to support classroom teachers in a physical classroom. Um, the fact that it worked remotely was a, was a nice side benefit, but that wasn't actually the reason it was built. Um, so I think, I think the, re the interesting thing with that, Chris, as well, that is that um, you know it, it can become a part of your just your lesson outline, like you like you do now as you're on the board. You know, do now this is this 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 while you're getting set up. Um, we all know as teachers, it's a great time to grab your coffee and rub stuff out and do that sort of thing. But yeah, you know, I had a look at one of our, our schools here in Auckland. The do now is basically kids know they come in, open the Chromebook, log in, go to classroom, do their three like lesson starters, and off yeah. you go. And and it's really nice when you have your classroom set up well with classroom. I got to the point where my students would go, they put their hand up and they go, oh, yeah, I know it's on classroom, isn't it? Check classroom first. If it's not there, then ask me. Yeah, good idea. So uh, there's a couple of things at the start of, I mean, I don't want to write at the start of the school year now. We're well and truly into it. But um, there's a couple of things to think about as you sort of set up these digital spaces. And I just want to just go through some of those. So let me just come out of this full screen mode here. Uh, oops, sorry, uh, wrong slide, and I'll go into classroom. Uh, so a couple of things to think about. First of all, um, is setting up the grade book. So when you come into classroom for the very first time, and I'm assuming most people in this group probably uh, know about classroom or have been into classroom, so I'm not going to start right at the very beginning. But when you um, come into classroom, there's a little gear wheel up in the top corner. There's a couple of things to think about here. You scroll to the very bottom. 
there's a marking calculation area at the bottom. And one of the things you can do, and this is assuming it's turned on by your administrator, of course, is you can set up the weighting of, of lessons. So in this example class I've got here, you can see I've got classwork, exams, homework, and thinking, and I've got each of them weighted for a different amount. So classwork counts more than homework, for example, in this in this case, um, as I think it should, but you know, that's my opinion. Um, uh, but what you can do is you can set those weightings up. They have to add up to 100, uh, and then you can set this to weighted by category. And what that means is as you then go through when you're collecting your student work and grading the student work over the course of the term, um, it will actually automatically place those weightings on the on the overall results for you. So that's pretty neat. Um, so that's the grade book you should set up. The other thing that you should uh, consider thinking about as you set up your classroom is this meet link here. So there's a meet link on the front page of classroom. And I'm just gonna go back to the main page and just show you. It's this button right here. It's one that says join, right? Now, this meet link behaves a little bit differently. I know we're all in a meet call right now, so clearly we all understand how this works, right? Usually you give someone a link, they click it, they come into the meet call. One of the things we really noticed when kids were doing a lot of remote learning was what we didn't want them to do was to come unsupervised into a meet call, so there'd be no teacher there. Uh, but the way a regular meet call works if you have the link to the call you can just join the call and so kids were reusing these these links that the teacher had you know run a lesson but the kid had made a note of the the url and they were going back and sitting around in this virtual space unsupervised which is not a good idea when you run a meet through google classroom using this join button what actually happens is a student cannot join this classroom until a teacher is present now, this presumes a couple of things. It presumes the administrators have actually set up something in the back end so that we know who is a teacher and who is a student. That's generally done in most schools anyway, right? But it means that now a student clicks that link, I'll click it for you, it'll open up a join link right there. And I am a teacher in this case, so that's why it's starting up for me. But if I was a student, it would pop up a button here and it, 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 I wouldn't be able to join this class until the teacher was actually there. Okay, that's a really important feature and a really key factor of the way Meet works inside classroom. Uh, it also means that when, at the end of the lesson, when the teacher closes the, the Meet call, that once that call is closed, a student can't come back into it. They can't reuse that link again until a teacher comes back again and is the first one to rejoin again. So, hey Chris, that's, um, and that's, that's specific to Meet calls in classroom, isn't it? So 100%. setting up the classroom gives you all those default behaviours straight away. Correct. If you just create a meet call, just, you know, if you go to meet.google.com and just generate a meet link, or if you do it through your calendar, it doesn't work that way. It only works this way if you use the join link inside classroom. That's why I'm thinking, you know, if you're setting up your digital space and you want to use meet calls to sort of interact with kids in that sort of virtual space, just make sure you do it through classroom because then it handles all of the safety and security stuff for you automatically. You don't have to think about it. Um, and your and your and your co-teachers in that meet link are also um, co co-hosts, aren't they? With the, absolutely. With the so if you look at this class, for example, I've got myself and Kimberly are the teachers in this class. We're both co-teachers, so we would both have the rights to sort of be the first people to start that call, mm -hmm. uh, and students, of course, would not. Um, the other thing, just to think about in setting up your space, is setting up the stream. Um, there's not a lot to think about in setting up the stream, like it's a place you type stuff in and it's a conversation page on the front page here. Uh, and if I just go back into those main settings again, the only thing you might want to think about here is on that stream, who should actually be allowed to leave comments on it? So think about there's two aspects of the stream. There's the post, which is the, the conversation starter, and there's the comment, which is the follow-up on a, on a post. So, you know, conversations are generally started by, I don't know, in the way I used to do this in my classrooms, I would want the teacher to be the one to start the post and the students to be the ones to comment. That's what I was comfortable with. But if you're not comfortable, you're on a different arrangement, you can have it so the students can do the post, the posts and the commenting, or you can change it so only the teachers can post and comment and students can't do either. So just you know, be aware that this setting is here. A lot of teachers don't realize and then they tear their hair out because kids are going crazy in the stream and they're leaving comments everywhere. You can turn this to students can only comment so they can comment to existing posts, but they can't start new ones. Um, it's kind of a, I think, a little bit of a sanity mode. Um, and the other one there, Chris, the, um, the classwork on the stream as well, depending yeah, absolutely. on how yeah. uh, some teachers like, some like it'd be nice and clean, just a chat space. Because, and, and kind of said, look, 
the, the classwork on the stream just makes it a bit of a higgledy piggledy mess. Others like, nah, let's put everything there. Yep. Yeah, when you create a piece of classwork, you can you can have it either appear on the stream or not. And if you want it to appear on the stream, you can have it like the full thing or a condensed version of it. So, you know, have a play with these settings, see what they look like, turn them on and off, just see what see what the difference is and just be comfortable with uh, whatever you choose. Um, but again, it's all part of setting up your class at the start of the, the sort of the year. Uh, we mentioned co-teachers before. If I click on the people link here, you can see Kimberly and I are a co-host here. But if I click on this plus button and add Steve. Oh, thank you. Oh. I was going to say. I was going to say. <laughs> I'm going to do it on your Chrome for you one, Steve. Nice, oh, perfect. So I'll say invite. So I've just sent an invitation there to Steve, and you can see he's been invited. And now, you know, as soon as he responds to the invitation, it'll show up as uh, a full member of the team here, and he'll be a co-teacher. And you can do that for uh, co-teachers, you know, prac teachers, assistant teachers, whatever. Whoever needs teacher level permission on that class uh, is good. Um, while we're on this page. Another thing you might want to set up in your classroom is the guardian summaries. So again, this needs to be turned on in two places. It needs to be enabled by the administrator. So if, you're, if your system decides you're not using this, they turn it off for everybody, then obviously nobody has it. But if it's turned on, then one of the things you need to do over here is guardian summaries. You can choose whether it's on or off for this specific class. So it needs to be on generally, but then on for this specific class. It is on in both cases here. So if I go back there, you'll see that I have this little link that says invite guardians. And when I click that link, I then go and enter the email address of that student's parent or guardian or aunt or uncle, whatever, whoever the guardian is. Um, and then what happens is every week, you can have it every day. I always feel that's overkill. But every day or every week, the system will automatically put together an automated email and send it to the guardian and let them know what work is late, what work is coming up, uh, all the work that's coming up in all the different subject areas. If the student belongs to multiple classrooms across the school for different subjects, it'll just arrange them all into one email so they're not getting multiple emails. Uh, it's a really good way for parents to be kept in the loop of what's going on in the classroom, and it creates no more work for the teacher because, I mean, assuming the teacher is putting the work inside classroom anyway, then it will just automatically uh, throw it out to the parents, guardians. Steve. Thank you. I was just using the hand raise function. Look at what I am. Um, yeah, and the nice thing about that as well is that only one person has to add guardians to a student. So if Chris adds guardians to Crystal, it will it will add them to all her classrooms. So sometimes people say, oh, what about if we get a new kid? Does everybody have to add them? As the guardians, no, just one person can add them. So adding guardians doesn't need to be, and it can be automated as well. Um, and that point about looking at the guardian um, notifications is that we had a, a, a group at school, our, our drama students, for instance, would use classroom for here's the bit to learn for this this week, this is what's happening at the show this week, this is the, 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 um, the schedule of rehearsals. And they'd switch it off because parents didn't need to know that. So right. you can choose who's going to get those guardian summaries as well, which is always a good idea. Excellent. Uh, all right. Um, so then that takes us over to topics. If you look on the classwork page here, you'll see I've got this classwork page divided up into topics. You know, originality, creativity, maths, homework, media, and so on. So it's a good idea. Like divide your page up into topics if you if you don't do that and the way you can easily do that hit the create button and there's a, the ability to create a topic down the bottom here so if i have a topic and i call it i don't know skateboarding right <laughs> i don't know why i chose that oh i can't type for some reason skateboarding maybe that's my pe uh, selection for this term right so i can create a category for that and you'll see now if i scroll down the very bottom or where is it up the top there it is there so it's just created that topic so put your topics in. Some teachers like to do it by topic. So like I know if you're a history teacher, you probably want to do, you know, World War II and history of the Peloponnesian Wars, whatever you might want. Um, but other teachers prefer to do like a week one, week two, week three. There's no rules about how you do it. Whatever works for you it is a good idea if you kind of agree within your school or in the year group, um, you know, that you're all using the same system. Otherwise, I think it gets confusing for kids. But um, whatever system you use is fine. Uh, hey, Chris, um, I also saw an amazing um, top uh, tip from, um, I think it was from Alice Keeler actually, saying you can even do it, do each of your kids' names as a as a topic, and then it's a nice way to differentiate your your work by that kid's name. 
Oh, um, I hadn't and, thought of that. That's a great idea. Yeah, and Nick also had a really good point. He's dropped in the chat saying you can also put emojis in the topics as well. I love emojis on Classroom because it does draw my my um, my um gaze to the place I should be at. I like yeah, that great, too. Great point, Nick. I like that too. In fact, if I'm just going to go rename, and uh, you can do this on, on any, I'm on a Chromebook at the moment. If you go uh, search, keyboard shift shortcut, space keyboard on the Chromebook, shortcut. search, search, shift, is it search shift space? Yep. Oh, oh no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Search shift space. Oh, it's not coming up for me for some reason. That's weird. Well, try right click on it. See how that does it. Yeah. It's all right. People get what I mean. So but you put emojis in. Um, one of the things that's cool about the, having the topic blocks is when you just say all topics, you can see I've got like this, um, I'll just go to maths, for example, right? I've got a maths topic here. If I go up here to the topic list on the side, when I click on maths, it only shows me that topic, but it actually unpacks all of the different things for me. So it actually shows me all of my math stuff unpacked, so I don't have to click on each one individually to un unravel it so to speak. And then finally, the last thing that's kind of cool to think about when you're creating uh, new stuff in the classwork page is the rubrics. So I am going to, I'll, I'll pick on this essay task, for example, uh, and I'll go to the edit page for this as though I was making it for the very first time. And you can see there is a little box down the bottom that says rubric. And what that rubric thing does is uh, it, it allows you to put a rubric attached to this task. If I click on that, I have the option to create a rubric from, from scratch, reuse an existing one, or import one from Sheets. I'm just going to reuse an existing one. I'm sure I've got one in here somewhere, so I'll click on reuse. It actually looks through all of my classes to anything that has a rubric attached to it. Uh, and I know this creative writing task has one here, so I'm just going to click on that and say select. And it'll take the one that was attached in the creative writing task, and it's going to bring it over here to this assignment so I can reuse that rubric. If I click on it and have a look and see how that looks now, you can see this one has uh, one, two, three. So persuasion, originality, and spelling and grammar. They're the three categories. And for each of the categories, it's got four performance levels. Um, you don't have to have the same number of performance levels for each category. You can have as many categories, as many levels as you like. And the other interesting thing to know about the rubrics, if I just go to edit mode on this, there is the ability to here to have scoring or not. So some people like to use a rubric and they don't necessarily want to assign points to it. They want to just have the kids work from the descriptions only. I believe there's some research that says that's actually an effective way to use a rubric, to not use points. Uh, but, you, yeah, whatever whatever suits you. So I like it to be pointless. I think rubrics are pointless, so I'll turn them off. No, actually, not, they're pointless in a good way. Uh, so I'll turn that off and save that. And you can see now I have my rubric, but it no longer has the points attached to it. So you have the option of doing it either way. And that is rubrics. Um, hey, Chris, have you got any work marked in your gradebook? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Hey, while well, I'm just on this page, yep. there's two things I'm not going to talk about today because technically they're not released yet, but you're seeing them on my screen, so I'm just going to mention them. There's this one called Practice Sets, which no doubt you've heard about, and it is coming, and we've got some schools beta testing these at the moment. Um, and we have announced this, so this is not new news. Uh, but practice sets is something that um, is like an automated AI tutor for for setting kids like you know practice tasks or homework or anything where you want to do a bit of drill to learn something um, that way. Uh, it's a great thing. We'll talk about that when it's fully released. And you might ask, this is a thing called a YouTube thing here. I can't really talk about that, but you've seen it now, so you know just we'll talk about it later. Hey, that's probably a really good point that if you are in our reference schools innovator or trainer communities you can sign up for our NDA roadmap sessions and find out about some of these things. So um, if you haven't had an email and you are an innovator trainer or at a reference school, um, reach out to your Google person. So Kimberly, myself, Chris, Jay, whoever you want to reach out, just reach out to someone and say, hey, what's that reference? That What's that uh, NDA roadmap thing you were talking about? Yeah, exactly right. All right, so there you go. Uh, that's a whole bunch of things you might like to think about, folks, as you're gearing up to get your digital classroom ready. Uh, set up the gradebook, the meet, the stream, the co-teachers, the guardian summaries, the topics and the rubrics. Just some of the things to sort of get that classroom set up so it's really functional. And then you can use it in a face-to-face in -face mode just as well as you, know, you would use it in a remote mode. All right, I am going to go back into slideshow mode here and... Uh, I'm going to go to this next slide because I'd like to introduce a guest speaker. Luke, you're on the call, yeah? Yeah, I'm here, Chris. 
Yay, fantastic. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Luke in just a sec. Uh, Luke Starzak is um, a Google certified innovator uh, and teaches at um, – Luke, you remind me of the school because you've changed schools and I can never think of a new name. Yeah. Norwood International High School, Chris. Excellent. Norwood International High School in um, South Australia. Uh, I saw something Luke was doing the other day with his calendars uh, and I thought it was amazing and I thought I'd like to share. So I, I, I asked him if he'd jump into the meeting today and share. So Luke, I'm going to hand over to you. I will let you uh, share your screen if you'd like to. Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. Let me get out of here and stop sharing that. Okay, over to you, my friend. Yeah. Sorry, just let me get this up. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been waiting, I guess, for this feature for quite a while, just as it pops up now. Um, essentially, I know that lots of people, um, if you're in education or other areas, and you might have um, multiple calendars that you're actually having a look at. And so what I did is um, we use Daymap here for our timetabling. So you'll see over here on my um, calendar list, I've got a little Daymap calendar being imported into here. We've also got this other one that's called Calendar. That's because in our department, we use Outlook for our mails. So that's my Outlook calendar coming in. Um, I've also got a personal one that I can flick onto there. Um, and then, and so this is sort of uh, everything that I do during the week. But then, you know, in order for people to actually schedule meetings with me, um, I'm not sure if you know, but if you schedule a meeting, None of these calendars get looked at uh, when to say whether I'm free or busy, um, which is a little bit frustrating. And so I was sort of like, well, how do I get around that? Because if um, we're not sharing calendars like I have previously at other sites, I'm using Google Calendar, then I need to be able to make a way um, for all the different people who might want to contact me to um, get in contact with me. And so what I once this was released, I think it was last year, um, uh, the the ability to create an appointment schedule, right? And so I don't know if you've already seen this. Um, you need to turn it on if it's not already on. So it sits uh, in your settings and then just down here and you will say create appointment schedules instead of appointment slots. So just check. I'm pretty sure Chris or Steve, you might be able to help me out here. I think this is that a plus workspace plus feature or not? No, no, I believe it's available to everyone, Luke. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Okay, then. By, by um, default, it uses the old calendar slots, which yeah. is the old style one. So you've got to come down there and turn it on if it's not already on for you. So what I did last year is I went into here and I created my, you know, help with uh, help with students. Okay, and I might say, oh, I want to create a calendar, and as you can see. Initially, it's just looking at my calendar that I currently have, and there's not really much going on there, but you saw on the other page, there was a lot going on. So in here, you have the ability to change your duration. You can you know, go in here and change, I wanna start at eight, and I, don't, I really only want the last meeting to be 3.30, and then copy that across all the days, and it shifts my schedule around. Um, you can you know, edit your scheduling window. So I want it available now or start and end. Just for some of you who might be coming up to parent-teacher interview time, start and end dates could be extremely useful for this, which is how we're looking at using it, is um, to actually schedule those through here. And I'll show you why in a, in a sec. The other thing you can do is maximum time in advance they can book and minimum time. So lots of the things with scheduling that we sort of know. So when generally I'm doing students, I really want 24 hours notice before they are coming in here. You can then change your dates of availability. You don't actually really need to do that anymore because there's a new feature that was added uh, a few weeks ago. So the other one is we can add some buffer time, max appointments per day. You might see I, I only really want to see four kids a day, but then this is the change. So down here, we can now say, well, I've got all those calendars. I'd really like you to block out my time according to all the other calendars that I know that I'm busy when they're on. And so now I've got an external calendar feeding into it um, for just some personal stuff. I've got um, my Outlook calendar coming in and I've also got my timetable coming in as well. And so now what happens is when we go next, um, this uh, whatever happens, it is gonna block out those times. Um, 
the cool thing about this is you can do different things for different groups of people. So if some of you haven't seen this yet, you can pick Google Meet video conferencing. The advantage this has over so many other tools on the internet is that a unique Meet link gets created for every single meeting. Um, I know here last year we ran a single Teams meeting for the whole time and we had to boot parents out, get them back. You know, it was horrendous. Um, you can do in-person, phone call, none to specify later, put a description in there, change features of the booking form, um, and then you can also like schedule when all this will get done. So let's say that we want to create this, what would it look like? So if we go into our booking page, What we can now see is that we've got a group of times um, where I am available. Now I'm on leave from the 1st of April. So you can see I've put my out of office stuff, that's already gone. Um, you can see some days are different to others. Like my clearly my timetable has been taken out of this. Um, what's really cool about this though, is that when all of this is done with multiple, I'm just gonna show you something different. So if we go back here, there's this other button here that says see all your booking pages here. Okay, if we click on that one, what we can actually see now is every single schedule that I have produced. Um, how I see this being used is as an example, I've got it in my email signature now so that whoever wants to book in with me, they can just select the appropriate method um, if I go to an example if I go to digital learning and innovation um, and someone needs to book in with me they actually have to I put in there a little text box that says topic of discussion so you tell me what you would like to talk to me about um, I'll just go back and let's say it's a parent carer meeting I've enabled the Google meet video conferencing because I think that that is important, but I've put a box in here. Oh, let me just, I've put a box in here where it actually, I want them to say, look, I, I know I've enabled me, but would you prefer to come in in person instead? Um, that just, it's easier to do it that way around than go and set the meeting up after, I think. Anyway, so that's why I did it that way around. So, yeah. I don't know. Is that okay? I think that's, that's amazing, Luke. And I think we have talked about this before on the, on the, um, I was going to say the podcast. We've talked about this before. And I think the difference is you've tapped into two brand new features here. One is the fact that you can now block out multiple calendars. That's a huge deal. And this overall screen where you can have multiple scheduling blocks for different things, and each of them has different like qualities and, and, and things set up, and you've got them all on one page. I think that's awesome. Yeah, and, and where we see it being used as well, as an example, we've got a whole staff Google site that we use. And I showed this to our principal the other day and she actually wants to create it for all of the leadership team so that, because you can embed these and so that we just embed it onto the website um, and then people have a really easy way of creating appointments that are looking over multiple calendars as we know that in schools we have lots and lots of different calendars we're feeding in. Yeah, yeah, I can see a huge thing for like parent meetings. Yeah. Um, you know, although I don't work in a school, one of, one of the biggest bugbears when you're not in a school is, is you know, people want to have a meeting with you and it's always like, oh, you're free on Monday afternoon? No. What about Tuesday morning? No. What? And you, you get do the back and forth. This is so much easier to just give them a link to your calendar booking page and they just book themselves in. Good stuff. All right. Thanks, mate. Thanks for sharing. That's okay. I'm going to take over the screen share again, if that's okay with you. Uh, my screen back again. Hey, and, Craig, and Chris and Luke, one of, one of the things to remember at the moment is that those meeting schedules are limited to 15 minutes as the shortest one mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, so I know when we talked about this in the first time, I kind of said, look, if you think they should be shorter than that, I know a lot of schools use five yep. minutes, um, maybe just, just click on that little uh, question mark and give some feedback and say they should be down to five minute sessions perhaps for education. Um, my little nudge there. Just uh, yeah, give some feedback to the, the team yep. and uh, see if we can get them shorter than that.
Absolutely. All right, let's have a little chat about AI. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, definitely a hot topic at the moment. Everywhere you, you, you turn seems to be people talking about all the different tools for generative AI and all smart AI and all the things that artificial intelligence can do. Uh, I think every tech company on the planet is predicting their future is all based around the use of AI now, so it's 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 a big deal. Um, you might have seen uh, uh, there was an update to the chat GPT thing that came out today, so everyone's talking about it. Um, one of the things that I don't want to overlook here is that artificial intelligence actually powers a whole bunch of stuff in workspace already. And often it's really subtle stuff that you might not even realize is AI. So things, for example, when you're typing an email and it tries to finish a sentence for you, like that's AI in, in place. The smart chips uses AI. The smart fill, if you go into a spreadsheet and it suggests for you, do you want to fill this formula down the page? That's AI in practice. Um, the explore tool, uh, and the explore tool exists in slides and docs and sheets and it suggests different things And it's all about sort of looking at what's going on on the screen and then trying to help be helpful about what it's going to suggest next um, Hands up if you use Google lens It's uh, it's an app on your phone. And you can use it to, to sort of you know point it at something It'll tell you what the something is the type of plant it is or you know who that famous person is You can use it for all sorts of things great for trivia night by the way. Shh, I did say that um, <laughs> But summaries in docs, the chat summaries, if you, if you use Google Chat, you know now if, you, if you're chatting with someone and you come back to a chat after a short break, it'll give you a little summary of, oh, since you've been gone, uh, Steve said this and Kimberly said that and we're working on this project together. And it'll actually give you the summary so you don't have to go back and read all the previous messages. Um, right now in Google Meet, um, I had to go past my window before, but you probably didn't hear it because the AI is actually noise correcting and taking out all the noise and stuff. There is a whole bunch of smart stuff going on in Workspace already. But yesterday, we announced some new things that are coming. Now, they're not here yet. Normally, when we do this uh, webinar, we only talk about stuff that's actually been released. Uh, it's kind of We've tried to keep that as a policy, but it, some of this stuff is so exciting, I just want to highlight it. Uh, now, there is a really short little video here that goes through. So I hope, Steve, just not if you've got the audio on this. No. No? Oh, hang on. Let me let me just check that screen share again. Um, I think. Let me... and, yeah, while you're doing that, that, Chris, yeah, this is definitely something that's um, it's kind of the, the possible. And, yeah, you're right, Luke, it is. Um, so it's kind of looking at what our plans are. And I know a lot of people messaged me when I shared this and said, when's this coming? It's like it's one of those things to say, wait and see, folks, wait and see. All right, now hopefully you'll have audio now. If you haven't seen this video, uh, just just like take in what's actually happening here. This stuff is coming to Google in the next, I don't know how long it's going to take. Things are in trusted tester mode. It will depend how that cycle of trusted tester goes. But this is the stuff that's coming to Workspace. Sound?
I've watched that a couple of times, Chris, and I just saw something new in there that I have not noticed before. Actually, that thumbnail there, creating images, I, I haven't seen that one before. Create an image to do with mag miniature magical gardens. I hadn't noticed that before. If, if you haven't so seen that little bit, rewatch that video. That's yeah. So what that is, is you've, you guys have probably heard of a tool called DALL-E2, which is the thing on OpenAI and generates images. You tell it, I want a picture of a, you know, a squirrel wearing a funny hat and dancing on a skateboard or something, right? and it'll generate the image for you. Um, the internal tool that we have that does that does a way better job than that. It's not publicly released yet, um, but it does a way better job. Um, and that will, that's something they're talking about having available as a, a thing inside slides, as you just saw there, you know, like you tell it, I want a picture of a magical garden and it will just generate a picture for you. It's not finding it on the internet, it's making it for you on the fly. All that generative uh, text thing you saw happening there, like it's it's the sort of thing you're seeing what's happening over in chat GPT, but you know, that's the sort of thing using an even better AI engine inside Google Docs um, and, and whether, you might be excited by that idea of having Google Docs being able to generate text for you automatically like that, or you might find it terrifying. I don't know. It depends on your point of view, right? But, and and all of this stuff you'll be able to control, turn it on and off as, you know, um, you know if it's not needed. But, you know, those are things that I put on the screen there the, to be able to draft, reply, summarize, prioritize your Gmail, brainstorm, proofread, write and rewrite in Docs. I don't know if you caught it in that video that they asked the AI to write a passage for them and said, make it more whimsical, and it rewrote the passage in a different voice. Uh, things like that, auto-generated images, workflows in chats. There's just all this really cool stuff that's coming. Um, if you haven't seen that video, I'll, you know, I'll share the slides as usual at the end, and you can go back and have a look at that. Um, but there is some really cool stuff coming that's all AI-powered. Uh, we've been doing AI for an awfully long time, and I, I think we're the best on the planet at doing it, to be perfectly honest. But um, you know, that's my opinion. Um, but yeah, lots of stuff, lots of cool stuff coming. Steve, any thoughts? Oh, so many thoughts, Chris. So many thoughts. Um, just having a look at the possible is amazing. I think one of the, one of the great things, if you follow Alice Keeler, um, she did post something recently with a hundred prompts for AI to help teachers, and it's a fantastic, fantastic look at. Some people are going, oh my God, teachers have become obsolete. We all know that's a complete lie. Um, but these prompts that can help you to do really cool things and, and kind of um, automate all the things that you didn't really think were massively time consuming, but can take stuff away from you. So you know, watch this space. Um, there are some amazing things happening out there. There is actually an unofficial non-Google uh, chat GPT add-on for, for docs you can currently get. And there's also one for Gmail, so you can you can bring the two together if you want to. They're unofficial; they're not ours. They're just they're out there. But as you know, if you look for any extension that add-ons, they're out there. So have a have a play if you want. Yep, absolutely. And it would be remiss of me not to just follow that up by saying that Google does have a bunch of principles of AI. Uh, some of you might remember Isaac Asimov and his three laws of robotics. You know, a robot should not harm a human. The robot should not do anything to prevent or whatever a human to come to harm. Like. This is kind of our principles of AI. This is if we're going to build AI, these are the things it should do. It should be socially beneficial. It should avoid creating or reinforcing bias. Um, it should be built and tested for safety. That's a big one. Uh, be accountable to people. Incorporate privacy design principles. Uphold high standards of scientific excellence and be made available for uses that accord with these purposes. They are our seven principles of AI that we underpin all of this stuff we do. Uh, and, you know, I, I, a couple of people have wondered why, you know, Google have not been more vocal about this whole AI thing that's going on. It's because we want to make sure we get it right. And when we do launch this AI stuff, we're, we're going to make sure it works really well and it's not telling you a whole bunch of rubbish that's not true. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard problem to solve. We want to make sure we get it right. Yeah, and Chris, I think that the, the, the three really important ones for me that I often talk to people about are three, four, and five. So three that it's built and tested for safety, really, yep. really important. And that's why we're doing a lot of work on this stuff that you see to make sure it is safe. Also, it's accountable to people. There is a team that is running this thing that has the big handbrake on it that won't just let it go off and go crazy. And the fifth one is that the privacy part is huge. You know, people have said, what about those prompts I type? Where do they go? What do you do with them? Does it get in kind of consumed into the, the great language model? So three, four, and five are super important. That's why I think... Um, we are taking our time to make sure everything is, is really good and really safe. Yep.
Yep. If you want to know more about that, the link at the bottom of the page there, ai.google slash principles. Uh, you can read more about that. Um, all right, what is new in Google for education? As usual, we just we'll try and go through some of the new stuff that's coming. I have picked out uh, six things for us uh, this month. The, the big ticket item is the refreshed workspace interface. Uh, hopefully you have this now in your Google workspace and it looks lovely, it's pretty, and it's, it's I think it's a lot nicer. Um, but some custom meet backgrounds, we've got some inline replies for classroom comments now, uh, and a couple of little things as well. Thanks, Luke, thanks for dropping in. Um, uh, there's a stopwatch chip, a smart chip now in Docs. I discovered this morning, this was not documented anywhere, but frameless YouTube in slides. Let me show you what that looks like. And finally, non-printing characters in docs as well, which I know a few people have been waiting for for a while. So here, here we go. So this is the refreshed interface for Workspace. Basically, we've cleaned up the UI. We're using a thing called Material 3, which is our design language internally at Google. Uh, so we use this design language for things like Android uh, and some other products. Uh, so it becomes really consistent right across the board. Um, there's some improvements in the way commenting works and the way the backgrounds and the rulers work. We've tried to add a little bit more um, subtle shading. Uh, so, some of the feedback we had about the previous UI was it was just too white. It was too, like it was, there wasn't enough definition around things and people had trouble spotting things. So we've got a lot of subtle shading now to help you solve that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a nice UI. There's new little logos for things. They've rearranged a couple of the menu items. So if you're looking for something that's not where it used to be, just hunt around because it is still there. We haven't taken anything away, uh, but um, we have just rearranged a couple of minor things. But mainly we've just made it look a lot prettier. So that is the refreshed interface. Um, custom meet backgrounds. Uh, you know you can change the background. So you can see behind me right now, this is not really where I'm sitting. I am not sitting in this particular room. Uh, and I can see a couple of other people. It looks like Donna, you, you're, you're not really in a library. Um, so what you can do is you can change your background, which you know you've been able to do that for a long time. The, the new thing is that a school administrator can go in and restrict to a specific set of backgrounds if you want. So for example, I went into my um, uh, can't do it here. If I went into my uh, settings earlier today and I just uploaded a couple of images. So if I go to my apply visual effects here and I just turn on say uh, this one here, I can make it look like I am in Sydney because I put that in as one of my administrator approved backgrounds. Uh, you can also put in silly things like this one as well. So it's the Simpsons there hiding behind me. All right, so you can put in your approved backgrounds and it means that if you decide to do that, um, the students uh, or teachers, they only have the ability to load the backgrounds that you allow them to load. So you can pre-approve them. So that's a nice, nice touch. Uh, all right, uh, moving on to the next one. Inline replies to classroom comments. Um, it works like this already in Google Docs. So if you leave a comment in a Google Doc, uh, you'll get an email about it and you check in your email and it'll have, you know, someone left a comment in your doc and you can you can reply to that comment from Gmail without needing to go back to the document. So you've been able to do that for a while. The new thing is it now works for classroom comments as well. So if someone, if you put a comment in the stream or anywhere in classroom, uh, you can now reply to it directly from the email notification without having to actually go back over to classroom itself. So that should save you a couple of steps there. Um, the stopwatch smart chip and the non-printing characters in docs. Let me show you those quickly. So if I just go over to here, share that tab instead. So I've just got a Google Doc here with just some random text in there. Uh, let me show you the, the stopwatch first of all. Um, we talked about the smart chips uh, in other, in other uh, versions of this where you type in an at symbol and you get a whole bunch of things you can insert in there, these smart chips. One of the new ones now is a stopwatch. So only got, and, and there's a couple more coming. Well, I'll tell you about those when they actually get released, um, but they're exciting as well. If I go stopwatch, it just puts a little stopwatch at the top of the page there, and you can just click it to start. Oops, sorry, click it, click it to start, right? And it'll start counting down or counting up. Um, so if you want to do something on a page, like you might have an activity on a page where it says, you know, read this passage and then discuss it for five minutes with the person next to you. You can actually put the timer directly in the page now. So I can think of lots of ways you might use this in a, inside a classroom, but having the timer in the page is kind of a nice little uh, addition. The other thing is if I just select, uh, I don't know, select it. If I go into the view menu and I show this new, new item here, it says show non-printing characters. Uh, and if I turn that on, you can see now I can see little blue dots between all the letters. It's showing me where a space is. Uh, I've got the little backwards P thing that shows me where the end of a paragraph is, and I'll put a page break in here as well. 
because there's more text down the bottom. So, you know, it's a little thing, but I know I've had lots of teachers ask about this because, you know, Word does it and Google Docs didn't do it. So, you know, now, now Google Docs does it as well. So hopefully that makes some people happy. Uh, and then the final thing is frameless YouTube video in slides. I actually got really excited when I saw this. Let me just uh, come out of this presentation mode thing, um, if I can. There you go. Uh, so you, you might remember that putting a YouTube video inside a slide, so I'm just going to go in here to insert. Hey, Chris, you're, uh, you're still in uh, your document. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Good, good. Uh, sorry. Thanks for that. Um, right. So uh, I'm just in Google Slides here at the moment, right? And you probably know that if you put a YouTube video and you go insert video and it brings up a thing where you can uh, bring up this thing here. So you search for something. I've I'll, I'll been talking about skateboarding all day, so I'll, I may as well put that in, right? So I'll put a skateboard video in here. So I, I do a little search. I find, okay, here's a best street skateboarding. That's great. Now, you remember when you put a YouTube video into a slide before? The YouTube video was normally a 16 by 9 widescreen format, but it dropped it in into a 3 by 2 format with black and white bars across the top, right? It always annoyed me like crazy that it did that. Now, when you insert a YouTube video, it actually goes in like, da -da -da, like so. It doesn't have the black bars at the top and bottom anymore. You just get the video, the whole video, and nothing but the video. And so it's a much neater way to insert videos into YouTube. Not, I mean, I, I, it's not a big thing, but it made me very happy because I like good design. Hey, that, Chris, can you do? Can you just go to um, go to slideshow on that one and show us what it looks like when it's in a, a full slide? Yeah, sure. So then it just comes up like doo -doo -doo, it's just loading. Yeah, it just comes up like that. Nice. But you don't get those black bars. Like that always used to annoy me. Like I don't know why they had to be there, but now they're not. So there you go. That is frameless YouTube videos in slides. I'm not going to play that for you. <laughs> we click past that. Uh, we talked about the inline comments. Oh, and look, one more thing. I just threw this little as a little freebie thing in. Uh, Clay, Clay uh, Smith, who is a Google certified innovator and trainer, and now works for Google over in I think New York, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah New York. So Clay, uh, before he worked at Google, he he just he liked messing around with with writing code. Uh, and he has a website at claycodes.org. Um, and one of the tools that he did was called Slides Timer, which is just a neat little extension you can install into Chrome. And it puts a timer. You can see on my screen there that timer is counting down from 60 seconds. It's 24 seconds, 23 seconds. So it's it, it's a timer directly inside the page. If I just escape out of there, you'll see all that is, is I've just put in, sorry, I've, I've lost the page. Uh, where did I get there? Um, it's just uh, bracket, bracket. And then the amount of time you want, close bracket, bracket, and it puts a timer directly into the page. There's all sorts of other, it can count up, it can count down, it can it can put the date in, it can put the time in. There's a whole bunch of things it can do. That's its simplest thing. You just, you know, enter a thing. Actually, let me just do one over here because I'll just show you how simple this is. If I go to a text box, literally just draw a text box, and I go bracket, bracket, five, colon, right, zero, zero, bracket, bracket, Right? All I did was type it in in a couple of brackets, and because the extension is running in Chrome, when I launch that, you can see it will just start counting down from five minutes. I, and I just I think that's a great idea for you know any student projects where you want to put a timer on how long the, the student talks or anything like that. It's a really simple, easy, elegant way to do it. All right. And Clay was one of those people that if you wanted something, he'd just go away over a weekend and build it. He's yeah, a, he's a great guy. Very I great wish there was this. Ask Clay and he'd build it. Yep. So that wraps us up for this week. I'm pretty much on time, actually a little bit early. So uh, we do this every month on the third Thursday of the month. Uh, next month in April, uh, we're going to be talking about Chromebooks. That'll be interesting. See, I'll be away. I'll be in Rio de Janeiro at the time. Um, bom, so bom dia. We will have to work something out. But yeah, next month we're going to talk about Chromebooks, uh, dig into that and talk about you know um, some of the cool stuff that you can do on Chrome OS these days. Uh, but we've got a whole bunch of other things coming up over the course of the year. We hope you can join us. If you can't, they're all recorded and they all get put up on the website. So you can go back and watch the replay if you need to. Uh, tell a friend. Um, I know, I was having a look at our, at our replays. We had a lot of people watching after the uh, fact last time as well. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great idea, Chris, to move it to this platform so that people can watch when they want. And if they're like me, they can watch it in double time as well. And it takes half the time. Excellent. 
Uh, get a live link to Slides Timer, please. Uh, yeah, just a second, Andy. I'll see if I can do that for you right this second. Um, if you just copy that link address and I will drop it in the chat like so. There you go. Is that? Hang on. Uh, <laughs> do I drop the right thing in? Ah, you're good. Yeah, that's it. And Chris, I can see that you're with your slide full screen. We can actually see your little slide control down the bottom left, which is also a new little update for slides. So slides in Meet, you can control from the Meet screen. Oh, can you see that? Can you? Yes, we could just oh. before, but now we can't. It's gone away. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. We're going to here. Yeah, if you want the past webinars, they all uh, exist on a YouTube li uh, YouTube playlist as well. So if you need to, we, I've, I've I've made them go back all of last year and I think part of the year before as well. So everything's stored there in case you ever want it. And as usual, if you want a certificate for attending uh, this session, you can just head over to bit.ly slash GFE certificate, fill the form in and it will email one to you immediately. All right. And on that note, uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask, I will stop the recording right now though. So uh, they don't necessarily get recorded. Stop recording. Uh, thanks everyone for joining.